Well, greetings, friends. I'm Pastor Mark McElraith, and I want to welcome you to Lake Grove Presbyterian Church, where we are partnering with Christ, who transforms the world one life at a time. Now, of course, today is the first Sunday in Lent, and so we're starting a whole new sermon series uh, this week. And of course, Lent is that season that leads up through, uh, through the uh, Holy Week, and midnight before Easter morning. And so this is a season of of self-examination. But with that, um, I wanna make sure that we keep in the front of our minds 
those who are still without power in our uh, larger community area. Let's be sure to keep them in our prayers uh, in this really difficult season. Of course, we also want to recognize those in Texas right now who are dealing with such tragic uh, weather as well. But a few announcements I'd like to draw your attention to as we uh, step into worship. First of all, I want you to know about our Spring Women's Bible Study. That begins in two Wednesdays from today. Um, if you join that study, you will be going even deeper uh, with Jesus in 2020, 21, as you, uh, as in 2021, as you consider together the next, uh, the next section of our Lake Grove 2021 devotional book called The Reservoir. Uh, this goes from March 3rd through April 28th, and you will be exploring what it means to live a prayer-filled life. As a matter of fact, throughout Lent, you'll see that prayer is one of our major themes. So you can join old and new Lake Grove friends for inspiring Bible studies, for, for ongoing small groups, and rich fellowship time every Wednesday morning from 9.30 to 11 o'clock on Zoom. Now, newcomers are always welcome. So we encourage you to invite your friends, let others know about it, and then go onto our website and register for that time. Again, be sure to join the Spring Women's Bible Study. Now, in this season, we know that many of you, many of us are dealing with difficulties. Certainly in this, in this particular season, we are weary this season. And sometimes it helps to to have someone to simply talk with, someone to uh, know what you're going through, someone who, with whom you can share your story in confidence. If you would like a friendly voice, a friendly ear to talk with and to listen to and to be with and to connect with, I encourage you to reach out to us and see about Stephen Ministry. Our Stephen Ministry is there for you to walk alongside you through those difficult seasons of life, and we would love to support you through that. If you would like to be a part of Stephen Ministry and, and learn about that, please email pa Pastor Susan Graham. Her email is susang at lakegrovepress.org, and you can find out more information and get connected in that way. Well, lastly, I have a very significant announcement. Um, Kathleen Fast, our Director of Youth Ministries, has been a faithful part of our staff for 15 years. And she has announced her departure to move to Colorado. Her last day with us will be March 19th. And we'll have a farewell celebration for her on that Sunday before March 14th. So be on the lookout for more information there. But boy, she has been such a faithful part of our church, faithful part of our staff, faithful part of our ministry for the past 15 years. And so we will miss her and what a big transition this will be. So join us for celebrating uh, Kathleen's significant years of ministry with us. Uh, that'll be March 14th. But with that, let's now enter into worship with our call to worship. Today, uh, Susan and Dora Graham are leading us in our call to worship. So let's join together with them. Good morning, Lake Grove. We're the Graham family. Please join us for the call to worship. The Lord gives ear to our cries. For we pray to the Lord. We pray, pray and eagerly watch for the Lord's response. Because of his unfailing love, we bow and worship. Lead us, O Lord, in your righteousness. O Lord, make the way before us clear and straight. Gracious God, lift us up and lead us in your strength. For it is you whom we worship. Amen. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arms, his love endures forever for the life that's been reborn his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise sing praise forever god is Strong forever, God. 
to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. think about it and whether you're alone or whether you're in a room with others just shout it out right now let everybody know what you are thankful for all right yeah I'm gonna wait for you go ahead
Amen. Well, friends, uh, for the season of Lent, the Our Story segments um, during this season will be filled with the theme of prayer. Uh, We will be hearing from several people uh, throughout these next Sundays regarding their prayer life and how they have encountered Christ, their story with Jesus through prayer. Well, today we have the privilege of hearing from Larry Bowman and his experience, his life of prayer. So I know you will be inspired by hearing his story. So let's hear from him right now. Prayer is is, uh, something I learned early on. I was staying with my grandfather when I was in second grade. And he used to get up every morning and he was down reading his Bible. And so he'd put me on his knee and we'd, uh, we'd end up uh, listening. He'd read the scripture and then we'd pray. And he prayed in different ways. So I started praying like my grandfather did. I'd get up in the, in the morning and I, I read a devotional. I uh, think about that. And then I, I begin to pray. And I pray for, you know, things in the, in the church, pray for our family, you know, and go from there. And, and uh, there are a lot of specific things I have to add in depending on what's happening. I start with, with a prayer that I learned a long time ago. It said, you know, uh, I'll only go through this life but once. Anything I can do to help or to share with other people in a loving way, you know, that's what I want to do. You know, as I think about an individual, you know, what kind of prayer do they need? And, you know, and with the family and with the church and programs like our job seekers and things. So. You know, there are all kinds of reasons to pray and ways to pray. I haven't been down on my knees as much anymore, uh, you know, <laughs> after two surgeries. So one of the first prayers I say, as soon as I wake up in the morning, and this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. So that's, that's the first prayer I say. And then we go from there, and depending on what the need is. My faith has been strengthened by prayer in a lot of ways. Uh, as I've gone through situations and, and things in the family or other people, you know, but first thing I do is, is thank the Lord for the day. And uh, then I begin to, to look at, you know, uh, one of the things that I pray early on in, in every prayer session is, you know, for the Lord to direct my thoughts, my words, my actions. So whatever I think, say, or do will glorify Him. My favorite part of the Lord's Prayer, there are two parts. One is, is uh, you know, praying that the, the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in, and in the part where it says, you know, forgive me my debts, you know, as I forgive others. And I think, boy, I, I could be in trouble on that one. <laughs> it has to be on how I forgive others, because sometimes it's hard to forgive others who have hurt you in ways. Well, it, it, it's first of all, to, you know, taught me to, to, to trust him. You know, and that's hard to do sometimes when things are going on. And it, it helped me understand that, listen to the Lord, you know, because when he tells you something and you learn from that and then you do it and it happens, you say, wow. And that, that, that's a, one of the prayer experiences I think has been most instrumental. You know, even if somebody asks me if I'm a Christian, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what they're asking. So I tell them I'm a follower of Christ. And they says, what does that mean? I said, I want to learn to love like Christ loved, serve like Christ served, and forgive like Christ forgave. And that's that's what prayers taught me, and that's what my granddaddy taught me. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you, Larry. Friends, in that spirit of powerful prayer, let's come before the Lord together now. Thank you, O God, that we can communicate with you whenever and however we want. And thank you for hearing our prayers right now. Please guide us through this Lenten season to strengthen our prayer lives, strengthen our channels of communication with you. Here we are gathered online, Lord, in heart and in mind from our households or wherever we may be, United, though, as your followers and wanting to praise you, to love you, to worship you. And yet here in your holy presence, we are mindful that we are not holy. 
We just admit that to you, God. We strive to align ourselves with your wise and loving nature, but we seem unable to get very close without your supernatural help. We blow it. We choose selfishly. We ignore you. So please forgive us all and also forgive us individually now as we confess in the silence of our minds these things for which we each need your forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you for loving us despite our sin. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that we are once again forgiven and renewed. And now we turn to today's scripture, Lord, to a new sermon series, to the insights our pastor has for us today, developed from the time he spent with you this week in preparation for this particular point in time, when you will speak in a specific way through him to us. How beautiful are Mark's feet today as he brings us good news. And may our ears be just as beautiful as we receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Well, friends, why church? You see, this Lenten season uh, is a time of self-examination. And so we are using this season as some church self-examination to ask, why church? You see, in this pandemic, God has shown us that the church is far bigger than any building. And so we ask, why church? Well, we actually find the answer to that question uh, in what we call the six great ends of the church, the six great ends of the church. And those six great ends will be the outline for our six Sundays here in Lent. And so today we are considering the first great end of the church. And the first great end of the church is, this is it, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. I'm gonna say that again. The first great end of the church is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Now we're gonna enter into this conversation by looking at the book of Romans. You see, in in Romans, uh, Paul says, especially in this segment we're gonna look at, Paul says that Israel has based their relationship with God on their obedience of God's law rather than on Christ. So with that, we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Let's listen now for God's word to us. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we could, we could use beautiful feet about now, couldn't we? I mean, wouldn't good news be great? <laughs> My family and I were freezing and without power for, for several days, and many are still without power in our community. We've had firestorms and ice storms and pandemic and, and quarantine and financial upsets and social isolation, not to mention the devastating earthquakes and, and catastrophic weather around the globe. We need beautiful feet. We need to receive good news right about now. Now, you may know that um, the Greek word for good news is the word euangelion. As a matter of fact, we transliterate that into English saying evangel or evangelism, euangelion, good news. Euangelion, good news is also, or evangelion, euangelion is also translated as gospel, good news, gospel, euangelion, and that's that same word. You see, ultimately the gospel is that good news that the world needs. That's why the number one great end of the church is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. In our text, you see that Paul says that the world needs the gospel because the world is zealous for God, but ignorant of God. So I have to be honest with you. I, I was zealous but ignorant this past week. You see, to make the best of the icy snow and our power outage, my daughter and I tried sledding. You see, our, our backyard is sloped with, uh, with stone-lined paths. And with the icy snow, one path was, was a toboggan-like chute. It was just irresistible. We, we couldn't hold back. And so my daughter, she went down first. And as the track went, it kind of curved a little bit. And at the curve, she slid over the stone edge and just kind of stopped there in the snow. Well, I was very zealous to show her exactly how it should be done. I was so excited to show her, but I was frankly zealous but ignorant, ignorant that my body's density would create more velocity than hers. So I shot down that path without calculating the physics of stopping. I accelerated all the way down toward a perpendicular uh, row of very large and sharp angled rocks. And so desperately trying to stop, I, I spun my sled and slammed into a jagged rock that punched through the bottom of the sled, shattering it and launching me into the bushes beyond. A splendid bruise still graces my hip this morning. I can feel it even right now. I was zealous but ignorant. See, that's what Paul is saying in our text 
today, zealous but ignorant. Even though humans are ignorant about God, they are naturally zealous for God, but they head for the rocks. It makes sense. You see, religion actually existed even before recorded history, we know. Religions are in every people group. No one invented the concept of religion and then had to sell it to us. We, we've always had some form of religion. It's always been there. Why? Because humans were created to enjoy God. That's why we were created to enjoy God, to even be zealous for enjoying God. And so humans in ignorance invent their own ways to reach God. They try to climb up to God, and that is what we call religion. Religion is our efforts to reach God, our herniating efforts to be in touch with God. But no matter how hard we try, we can't. No matter what we do, we can't reach God because God is God. And here's the good news. We don't have to reach God. God reaches us. God's self-revelation is Jesus Christ. God himself comes as Jesus Christ. And so in our text, when, when Paul says that Christ is the end of the law, Paul is saying through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, God did religion for us so that we don't have to. See, God turned religion on its head rather than us working hard and climbing up and rather than us climbing up to God through religion, God comes down to us through Jesus Christ. Dare I say it this way? Through Jesus Christ, God effectively got rid of religion. We don't have to reach God. God reaches us. That's the gospel. That's why the number one great end of the church is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. So then what do we do about that? How can we be saved? Well, in our text, you'll see verse nine right there. Verse nine has the answer. It's all about lips and hearts. Paul says, if you confess with your lips and if you believe with your heart, you will be saved. Well, confess and believe what? Confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That Jesus Christ is Lord and Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Confess and believe that. Do you believe that in your heart? Do you confess that to others with your lips? Then you're a Christian, a Christ follower. If you want to know more about that relationship with Jesus Christ, I would love to talk with you. Please let us know on the care email or the pastor's uh, care voicemail line. Please let us know. I would love to talk with you more about that. Because friends, the number one purpose of the church is proclaiming the gospel. Well, speaking of proclaiming, I have to tell you, I love Disneyland shamelessly. And I will proclaim that to you. As a matter of fact, a friend tells me that Disneyland is the biggest human trap a mouse ever built. But I love it anyway. Every time I go, it is such a thrill. The, the rides, the shows, the spectacle, the characters, the dole whip. Even It's a Small World. I love it all. 
And if I meet someone who has never been to Disneyland, I would proclaim to them how amazing it is, how they would love it, how fun it is, how, how they've got to get to know Disneyland. I am zealous for Disneyland and I'd tell anyone about how fun it is. Now, shouldn't we be more eager to tell the world about Jesus Christ than about Disneyland? Because how much more thrilling is knowing the God of the universe who, who brings renewal and life and, and freedom for all people through Jesus Christ? The world is zealous for that, but ignorant. So how will they know? Well, that's actually what Paul is asking in our text, verses 14 through 15. That's what Paul asks. He writes, But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? Paul is crying out, They need Jesus Christ. Who will tell them? Who will tell them? Like, what about, what about the addict who, because of his body's chemistry, has to score his next hit just to survive? He's dying for the good news. What about the business tycoon who sacrificed everything for living the dream only to find her life empty? She's dying for good news. What about the elderly man alone in the corner of a sterile facility without anyone to talk to for months on end? He's dying for good news. What about the teen rejected by her family because she finds herself pregnant? She's dying for good news. What about the drunk driver in prison being eaten away by that crushing guilt and regret due to vehicular homicide? He's dying for good news. What about the woman whose life is shrapnel because her husband and child was killed by that drunk driver? She's dying for good news. Now, what about Jesus Christ? who died for the good news. Who will tell them? Who will tell them? The world is desperate for the good news of Jesus Christ. So who will tell them? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. If the number one great end of the church is proclaiming the good news to save all people, who will tell them? You. The church is not a building, it's you. If you have lips and hearts believing and confessing in Jesus Christ, then I believe God has given you beautiful feet to bring good news to them. George Leal had beautiful feet. George Leal. George Leal was born a slave in 1751. Leal grew up living a very moral life. However, while listening to a preacher proclaim the gospel, Leal realized his, mortal, his morality could not save him. So he called upon Jesus Christ, believing and confessing him as Lord. Immediately after accepting Christ, 
Leal prayed that God would use him to proclaim the gospel. And he began sharing Christ with his fellow slaves. White members of his congregation recognized his gifts for ministry. And Leal was then ordained to preach and was granted his freedom, proclaiming the gospel among the black population of the Savannah area. And then, because of the outcome of the Revolutionary War, Leal was imprisoned by authorities who did not believe that he was really free. And even there, Leal proclaimed the gospel. Well, thankfully, an acquaintance named Kirkland proved Leal's freedom. So Leal, indebted to Kirkland, joined him heading toward Jamaica. And from there, Leal proclaimed the gospel and his proclamation of the gospel grew reaching Jamaicans. He, he preached there in Jamaica. He baptized hundreds there. He birthed a, a, quite a number of congregations there. At times, he was harassed by the white colonists and authorities for agitating the slaves. And he was imprisoned for over three years. Even so, by 1814, Leal's efforts had introduced around 8,000 people to the good news of Jesus Christ, who became Christ followers, who themselves confessed with their lips and believed with their hearts that Jesus Christ was Lord and was from, raised from the dead. You need to know George Leal's name. You see, George Leal is known as the very first American missionary, white or black or, or any race, to go overseas. The very first one. George Leal shaped the history of our faith because he was being the church by proclaiming the gospel, confessing it with his lips and believing it in his heart, giving him beautiful feet wherever he went. Can we have beautiful feet like that? Well, let's do a little math. See, I figure that if you are 45 years old and you are a faithful church attendee, averaging, let's say, 39 Sundays out of 52 a year, that means that you have heard 1,755 sermons. You have prayed 3,510 prayers and you have sung 5,265 songs or stood next to somebody who was singing them. But <clears throat> it may very well be that you have never had the joy of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with somebody else. Do you have the lips and heart and feet to do that? Do you? I mean, after all, the number one great end of the church is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. So listen up, Lake Grove Church. Christ is sending you out with beautiful feet because the world is zealously desperate for the good news of Jesus Christ. So go, go be the church. Go proclaim the good news. Go proclaim Jesus Christ to the world. Go. Amen. Please.
Thank you, Christina and Jeremy. And may our hearts sing no other name than that of Jesus. Let's continue together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the logic of the Apostle Paul. How indeed should those who don't know you hear about you if no one tells them? And so we thank you that we all have that privilege in fact, that you entrust to us the responsibility to live out the good news so that people will see you at work in us and want to know more. Thank you that we get to be the ones with beautiful feet, bearing your love and message to those around us. It, it really is a beautiful thing. It can be eternally beautiful. How beautiful also are the hands of frontline medical workers ministering to the sick these days, Lord, testing for COVID and administering vaccinations. Lord, please have mercy on us and help us catch up and get in front of this killer disease. How beautiful, Lord, are the hearts of those in our congregation continuing to reach out and connect with our church family Thank you for those who made those Valentine's greetings, handmade cards to lift our spirits. Their love is your love. And how beautiful, Lord, are the compassionate efforts of our mission partners seeking to share the good news in both word and deed. Today, we remember especially the villagers of La Bendicion in Nicaragua, and our Agros partners supporting them. And closer to home, we ask your blessing on Portland Rescue Mission as they currently are maximizing their welcome to people of all ages from the streets, people living in tents, suffering from hunger, from the cold, from addiction and mental illness. And in our own church family, Lord, how beautiful are the volunteers who help us care for each other by praying and making phone calls and even visiting those who are ill, those who are down in various ways. Thanks for the deacons and Stephen ministers and prayer warriors and connectors. How beautiful it is, Lord, that you care for us as we care for each other. Thank you too, Lord, for the beautiful efforts of our discipleship team as they guide us meaningfully through this season of Lent. And finally, Lord Jesus, thank you for the beautiful unity we have in you. It's a unity toward which we aspire as we seek to follow you, and it's a unity we can actually experience right now as we unite in the family prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, uh, as we conclude our service, I just want to remind you to, to click on the buttons you'll see to the right of your screen here if you're watching with us live. Click on those buttons as a way to continue to be engaged with us, whether it's through fellowship or other events. Also check out our events page as well. We wanna be in relationship with you and engaged with you, not just Sunday mornings, but all throughout the week. And there are so many ways to do that. So be sure to take advantage of that on our website. And also, as always, we wanna be in touch with you through our care line. So 
drop us an email at care at lakegrovepress.org or uh, give us a call at our pastor's voicemail phone number. Leave us a message there. We want to know how you're doing. If you're going through a difficult time, we want to walk alongside you. If you're going through a celebration, we want to know about that as well. So please be in touch in those ways. But now let's hear the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as with beautiful feet we go. We go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the world, both now and forevermore. And all God's people shouted, Amen. was given for mine when I could not see how I could be free Jesus you rescued me your word is helping me see your wrath was waiting for me then you sent your son through mercy he won my fear of death is done i stand in the shadow of the cross dead to myself but i'm alive in you But I'm 